Welcome to Jordan. If you're joining me for the first time, hi, I'm Caroline. I've spent the last week and a half exploring some of Jordan's best highlights and fallen in love with the food, the culture, its landscapes, history, and most of all, the people who call this place home. I've been fortunate enough to float around in the Dead Sea and experience one of the resort hotels on its shoreline. I've explored Petra both at night and during the day, realising that not only is it a fascinating place for history buffs, but also for an avid hiker like myself too. Speaking of hiking, we've hiked through Wadi Gwir into its green, lush oasis that's full of life, and up Jabal Al Hash, which sits on the Jordanian Saudi Arabia border in Wadi Rum. We've explored plenty of other pockets of the desert with thanks to our trusty guide, stopping for quick photos, strolls through canyons, clambering up onto arches, or even a bit of a cheeky sandboarding session. In the last episode, I explored the phenomenal Jarash, and today I'll be diving further into Jordan's Roman history, this time looking at a man. Good morning and welcome to a man. We're starting off in the morning with a really lovely breakfast. We've got a little bit of traditional stuff such as the za'atar bread, which is like some herbs and some sesame seeds, and I've chiseled a little bit of olive oil over that. And then some less traditional, such as American pancakes, some jam and bread. But what I really love about what this hotel has got is that they've got muesli with yogurt and fresh fruit. We are sat eating our breakfast out on this amazing rooftop with a spectacular view over a man. What you might be able to see over in the distance is the hill with the citadel on it and today we are going to be doing a walking tour around a man and that citadel is going to be our first port of call. The thing about a man is that it's full of jebels, so you're constantly having to go down hills and then back up hills. And I guess this hill that takes us up to the citadel must be the main one because you might be able to see just behind me there that there is a whole row of taxis. So if you're coming when it's a bit hotter or you just can't be bothered to hike up the hill, just come to this street here and then you guys can hop in a taxi and you don't have to go all the way up all on your own. These, when we were in Petra, were like two dinar, which is about two English pounds. And that's the equivalent of about 40p in English. It's crazy, like as soon as you come away from anything that's super touristy, like the prices just revert back to normal prices. The walk through the streets up the hill wasn't too bad and we've now made it to the citadel. It sits on top of a man's highest hill known as the Jebel al Kala'a at 850 meters above sea level. The citadel they believe was used either as a fortress or as an agora which I've just gone and learnt was a meeting place for people to either take part in commerce or politics. One of the better preserved ruins within the site is this, the Temple of Hercules. They are expecting that it was Hercules' temple because of nearby arms and fists or hands. And obviously Hercules was known for his extreme strength. And it was right up, as I said earlier, it's the highest point in the city. And the idea was that everyone all around this area would be able to see the Temple of Hercules. Behind me are the remnants of a Byzantine church and what seems to be a common theme running throughout Jarash yesterday and the citadel today is that as time moved on in history people dismantled those temples and used the stones in order to build the churches. Mm. 
There was no natural spring on top of the citadel, so being able to collect and harvest water was very important. The huge cistern sat behind me, collected water that either came off of roofs when it rained, or there were very clever channels built and dug throughout the citadel area that channeled water into there. It's ever so slightly sloped on the bottom so that unwanted silt would go to the very bottom of that slope. And then the bottom of the cistern was filled with a waterproof plaster that helped prevent water from percolating through the rock and it disappearing from the residents being able to utilise it. Behind me are the ruins of the bathhouse. The bathhouses in Roman times were fascinating as they consisted of lots of different rooms. When you entered, there'd be a disrobing room. There would then be another room that was a furnace where the fire would burn through the wood in order to be able to heat up the water. You would have hot rooms, warm rooms, cold rooms, and it was a place where the people could gather and socialise. When I visited Roman sites in the UK, the bathhouses have always been quite a big deal. What I've found since visiting Jordan is that at the Roman sites, they don't seem to be quite as big a deal. And I do wonder if maybe that's for cultural reasons. So in the UK, we don't really have things like hammams or the Turkish baths, but they seem to be a bit more common here. Therefore, is it maybe that a bathhouse where everyone comes and communally gathers isn't really seen as that different? Whereas obviously in the UK, it is and another thing that I've picked up on is that most of the Roman sites that I've visited in the UK the bathhouses tend to have been right in the corner where the prevailing winds would then push the horrible smoke that's being burnt from the wood away from the town away from the settlement across the countryside whereas with this particular bathhouse it seems to be in amongst the other parts of the ruins so we've still got more to this side and more to this side and i don't know if that might come down to the fact that the cistern is right here and they had to build these baths right next to the water source and therefore they couldn't afford that luxury of putting it right in the corner of the settlement We've now come through into what was a square and all around the outside of the square were market stalls. What's left behind me was a mosque and that's because this was an Islamic town. I believe like Umayyad is the correct word for it. I'm about to pass now through the archway which I think would take me into where most of the residents were. But what I've then also realised through passing through here is that that bathhouse wasn't actually a Roman bathhouse which probably makes sense as to why it did didn't have it in the corner and it's because it was just an Islamic bathhouse. This here is the colonnaded street and what I find really interesting is that it would have actually been restricted in access with gates probably at either end and that's because there were residential units that would lead off of the side of here. The other thing that's really fascinating about the street is you can see really clearly where the water would run down and then go underground leading it through those underground systems to that cistern where the water was collected. We've seen the main highlights at the Citadel and we've spent way more time in here than what we were originally expecting to and there's plenty more in the city of Amman that we're still wanting to see. So I think we're going to round it up in here and we're going to try and get off of the hill as the next stop might, I can't remember now what it said in our walking guide but I think it might be the theatre. detour off of the main 
direct route down to the theatre and we've come to a little plaza that sticks out over the edge of the hill giving the most spectacular view of both the theatre but also of the hills, the jebels that all of the houses and shops sit on. Theatre, you might have noticed that there was a tour guide asking if we wanted to enlist as services. At the larger sites such as Petra and Jarash, we found that the tour guides weren't quite so forthcoming with that. They just tended to have like a little office that they sat in, and I think it's that there's enough people who go and enlist those services. Whereas at the smaller sites such as this theatre, and we found the same up at the Citadel at the top, they do tend to be a lot more engaging. They'll start by asking, Where are you from? They'll usually compliment wherever you say that you come from, and then they ask. But what we found is just by being really polite and just saying, Oh, you know, we're fine, thank you, that's it, and then you don't get pestered or hounded from there on out. The Roman Theatre could seat up to 6,000 people and it was designed with three tiers. The rulers of Philadelphia, what a man was known as at the time, would sit on the lowest tier. The next tier up would be military and other diplomats and then right up here, right in the gods where people would have to really squint although they would obviously get an excellent view of the whole stage were then the general members of the public. The theatre was also designed in such a way where the sun would predominantly remain on the stage for most of the day and for as much of the day as possible the seating area would be left in the shade making it just that little bit nicer for the spectators. Because we've come in autumn, it means that there's not an awful lot going on here except for obviously the restoration work of the wooden stage. If you come in the summer months when there's a lot of festivals going on in Man, this is actually used for some performances still. And I imagine that with the Roman acoustics that these sorts of theatres are so well known for, I bet this would be an amazing place to come and listen to some music. was absolutely amazing. One thing that I noticed when I was in there was that there was a grill at the very top and it turns out that there was originally a statue of the goddess of Athena but it's now been moved into the Petra Museum. The stairs going back down are absolutely perilous, very very slippery and some of them are a little bit slanted downwards so I, I almost stacked it at one point. And the other thing is that earlier on in this trip we went to Petra and we learned that the theatre in Petra is the only one that's built into the side of the rock face whereas with this one it's obviously an earth hill so they've dug away at it and then they've brought in the slabs of stone. It turns out that way back in the 1950s when this theatre was restored it wasn't done very honestly and unfortunately all of the materials that have been used were not the ones original to this theatre. It's still spectacular regardless. <laughs> This is the Odeon. It was built next to the bigger theatre. How many people does it seat? 
Top of 100. I guess. How many people does it seat? Let me find the page. What page is it on? 55. Yeah, a couple of hundred, 500 odd people. I'm sorry, <laughs> how many is a couple? A few. A few hundred. It sits 500 people, according to the book. Sorry, 500 odd people. Not normal people, but odd people. It was built in the second century, assumed to be for musical performances. They reckon it potentially had a wooden roof or a temporary tent roof to shield the performers and audience. Like its bigger sibling, quote unquote, from the book here, from the Roman theatre we've just come from, it is still used for occasional festival performances today. That's it, that's all I know. If you quite like Andy being in the vlogs <laughs> and giving you information about places... Dislike the video. No, be sure to give the video a thumbs up so I know. And then that way I can get him to appear a little bit more regularly. Philadelphia, which is what Amman was known as during the Roman times, was made up of two sections. There was the upper part, which is where we started today at the Citadel, and then there was the lower part. There were two main avenues, the Decumanus and the Cardo. Where the two of those joined, we had this, which was the Roman fountain. Now, I do believe that in comparison to where we were yesterday, I do think that the one at Jarash was a little bit more impressive than this one. I'll stop this video here, though this only took us until lunchtime. The afternoon and evening in a man was a whirlwind foodie adventure, eating unbelievably cheap foods, trying the Arabic delicacy that is sheep's brain, checking out the local fruit, vegetable, meat, fish, Arabic sweets, and so on and so forth souk, trying the incredibly well-known kunafe, and finally coming across some of the most welcoming local Jordanians making this city one of the highlights of our trip to Jordan. I cannot wait to share this video with you next Sunday.